Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. I invite you to rise and face the cross as we begin this uh, Easter day with the processional. We begin with the uh, opening sentences of the invocation. Gathered in, our, in the name of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we rejoice to celebrate this day that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. The stone the builders rejected. Has this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Christ has the resurrection in these words. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. While well, they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Remember how he told you while he's still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.
why do you seek the living among the dead? To whom shall we go? Jesus has the words of eternal life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And why do you come to him today? I live in a world that is sick with sin. It suffers from war and hunger, cruelty, bloodshed, and death. Families are torn apart by greed, selfishness, and grief. Many deny, ignore, or mock my God. My own life is stained with sin. I come confessing my failure to live in the good news of Jesus' resurrection. I come trusting that Jesus Having been raised now with Christ, let us seek those things that are above, confessing our sins against God and against each other, and trusting His grace in Christ Jesus for forgiveness. Let's take our sins to Him as we pray. Jesus, I remember and cherish your death on the cross for me. You paid for my sins. By your rising from the tomb, you destroyed the power of sin and death. Forgive me, heal me, renew me, lead me to live in the joy of your grace and share in the richness of your abundant life. Your sisters and brothers in Christ, Almighty God has given you the new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And in him you are forgiven. Rejoice in this good news. And now in the stead and by the command of the risen Lord, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. His tomb is empty. Forgiveness is mine. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, by your one and only Son's death on the cross, and his glorious resurrection. You have freed me from slavery to the power of sin, death, and the devil. I praise you for having sent the warrior I needed. Make me die every day to sin, so that I may live with him forever in the joy of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Chapter 19. As, uh, yeah, okay. I'll try to stay on one side or the other here and see what happens. Um, as we turn out of the Old Testament, we turn to the final lesson for this day, which is from Job, uh, chapter 19. It's that place where Job, in spite of all of the challenges that were coming into his life, dealing uh, with sickness, death in his family. Uh, he speaks about the rock-solid hope that he has in uh, seeing his Lord even after his death, and he does it in these words. Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth, and after my skin has been destroyed, Yet in my flesh, I will see God. I'll see him for myself with my own eyes. I am not another. How my heart yearns within me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's known as the great resurrection chapter of Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And this is the very tail end of it, which answers the question, so what? So if Jesus rose from the dead, what difference does it make? And this is what Paul uh, writes. Listen. I tell you a mystery. We'll not all sleep, but we'll all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has clothed itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing prove you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to rise for the reading of the gospel, which is uh, John's account of the resurrection in John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, and she saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over, and he looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. That cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed, though they still didn't understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus said body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. And this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but didn't realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? And thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you put him and I'll get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Don't hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Um, I know it doesn't say it in your bulletin, but we're having a children's lesson. So you may be seated. We invite the kids to come forward for the children's lesson. So come on up. Come on. And we have a real moms and dads to come to. So if they need a little encouragement, come on with them. Come on up and find a seat on the steps. There we go. If I said moms, my grandmas can come too. <laughs> All right, around this time of year, we usually see a lot of eggs. It's real eggs. What do we do with real eggs at Easter time? We dye them very often, right? We boil them, make them hard, and then we dye them. What do we do with plastic eggs around Easter time? Hmm? What do you do? I know what we do at our house. What do you do? Well, we do something else with our eggs. We hide them. So that they can, oh yeah, right? So that they can do an Easter egg hunt, right? And very often there is little things inside of Easter egg. It might be some candy, might be some money, but a little something for them to collect as they're uh, gathering around. So when my grandkids come, we'll have a little Easter egg hunt at our house too. Well, I brought some eggs today because uh, I want you to think a little bit about what's inside an egg. What's inside an egg? Hmm? What's inside an egg? Yeah, a little chicken that's, that's eventually going to hatch. And um, I brought eggs along because, you know, I have an egg every day. I have eggs almost every day for, for my brunch. I only eat twice a day. And I eat my brunch around uh, 10 or 11, whenever I get to it, in the morning. And it's made with eggs, but it's not made with uh, an egg like this. It's made with, with eggs that are scrambled, so I have to do that, right? I have to open the egg and, and, and get it out, and then I get a fork, and uh, I whip it up, and actually I make one for four days in a row. I make one on a big pad, I, I use five eggs and a little bit of egg white, and then I fill it with all kinds of veggies. So it's got broccoli in it, it's got peppers in it, it's got onions in it, 
has got sometimes carrots in it. Whatever is left over in the fridge, I put into my eggs. Okay? And then I eat that every day, and, and I expect every time I open an egg, this is what I'm going to get, right? I'm going to get a, an egg yolk, that's the yellow part, and then the white part. But um, uh, I've got another egg I want to open here. But I'm not going to crack it on the bowl. I'm going to do this. What do you think? Who wants to do it? Me. <laughs> Smack it. What happened? It broke. It broke. What's in there? Nothing. Were you surprised? You should have been surprised because because you say, yeah, Pastor been in real trouble with my mom if egg yolk had sprung spread out all over my clothes, right? But it's a surprise when we open an egg and there's nothing in there. And that's what happened that first Easter. They went to open a tomb where they put dead bodies and guess what? When they opened it up, nothing was there. And we know why it wasn't there. It was because Jesus, who had died on the cross for all of our sins, he didn't stay dead. Death couldn't, death couldn't hold him. And he rose again on that first Easter Sunday. And it gives us hope that, um, that when people die in our lives, it's not the end, just like it wasn't for Jesus. But we're going to see him again in heaven. And today we celebrate that surprise on that first Easter Sunday. And, um, and so let's thank him for that in our prayer today. Would you join me in prayer? We'll uh, pray responsibly and break the congregation. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, thank you for surprising, thank you for surprising all, the people who came all the people who came to where they thought you would be. You were not in the tomb. You, were not in the tomb. you rose from the dead. You, rose from the dead. you, ate, and you ate and spoke and talked with your disciples for 40 days. They got to see you. They got to see you. They got to hear you. They got to hear you. They got to touch you. They got to touch you. Help my ears be open. Help my ears be open. To listen to you. To listen to you. To trust you. To trust you. And to be surprised one day. And to be surprised one day. When you bring me to heaven. When you bring me to heaven. Amen. Amen.
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Grace, mercy, and peace are all yours from God, our Father, and our risen Lord Jesus Christ this day. In a cemetery in Hanover, Germany, there's a tomb which is known as the Geoffnetus Grab, or Open Grave. It's a tomb of a noble woman. Her name was Henrietta von Ruling, and she died in 1782. So think right about the time of the Revolutionary War. It's a, a tomb that's constructed of very, very heavy stone, thick stone, almost like a, a fortress. And on the a very heavy uh, tombstone resting on it, the, that stone bears this inscription in German, but translated as follows. This tomb bought for eternity may never be opened. This tomb bought for eternity may never be opened. But in spite of this uh, inscription, Frau Henriette's uh, strongly fortified tomb has in fact been opened because shortly after her burial, a birch tree germinated at the base of the slab of the mountain. Over the years, of course, it grew wider and larger. And slowly but steadily, the tree's roots and trunk forced its way and raised the tombstone and, and eventually opened the grave. And so, despite the inscription that it should never be opened, it's called the Gaofnitus Grav, or the Open Grave. Well, almost 2,000 years ago, another tomb was made as secure as possible just outside the city of Jerusalem. Every precaution was taken to make sure uh, that there would be no entry into it. It was hewn out of rock with only one way in and one way out. A very heavy stone was rolled in front of the door and uh, in Accord with the request of the Jewish leaders, a guard, a custodia, which is the smallest group in the Roman army, and a squad of four soldiers was stationed at the tomb. And then the Roman seal was tied across the tomb with the understanding that anybody who, without uh, proper authorization, breaks a Roman seal will die. It was as secure as a tomb could possibly be. I doubt there were any other tombs in Jesus' day and age that were secured the way his tomb was. And yet, only 30, 36 hours after that Palestinian tomb had been secured, it was discovered open. The boulder was rolled away. The guards were gone. The seal was broken around the ground. And, and very interestingly, the as John records it, the grave clothes had been nicely and neatly folded. Not something you do if you're in a hurry to steal, to steal a body. And uh, the body was missing. And you and I celebrate what later the disciples realized over the next 40 days that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And so Paul in his letter to the Corinthians has already talked about the evidence. The people who were witnesses, uh, like the 12 disciples, like uh, Peter and James, and uh, the more than 500 brethren, it's a reference that Paul has that we don't have any other record of that Jesus appeared to at one time. Um, he refers to all of those appearances and, and, and then he points to the reality of the fact that Christ has indeed been risen. But what difference does it make? Why does it matter? Well, he concludes the letter with, uh, or this chapter, uh, with, I think, at least two points. First of all, that it makes us confident of the secure future that we have in store for us. And secondly, it, it leads us to commit ourselves to steadily follow Jesus as Lord not just to get to heaven, but through life. Um, and uh, so we just want to kind of walk through the text a little bit today and, and let God's word kind of encourage us with that kind of confidence. Confidence, first of all, that we have a secure future. And, and you see it in these opening words of this particular text. It says, listen, I tell you, a mystery will not all sleep, but will all be changed in a flash in the uh, twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and we will all be changed. And I want to focus on just those uh, three words, mystery, sleep, and change. 
first. First, he says it's a, a mystery. Now, you and I might think of a mystery as something that can't be figured out, you know. Uh, but this is not the way where the word mystery was used in biblical times. Uh, that particular word meant something you could only know by revelation. So I'll give you an example. Uh, my great-grandfather on my dad's side, uh, my grandmother's father, played the hammered dulcimer. Did I ever see him play the hammered dulcimer? The answer is no. I never met the man. I met his wife, my great-grandma was alive when I was uh, a little boy, but grandpa, our great-grandpa on that side had already died. Well, how do I know that he played the hammer dulcimer? You know? Um, and uh, it's because my grandma told me. And she could remember uh, how he uh, took little pieces of wood and he would curl the end and boil it uh, as it was boiling so that he could make the hammers because there were no music stores to buy those at in that, that day and age. And about how he played at weddings and she danced many a time to her, her uh, dad's uh, hammer dulcimer as a part of a band that had come from the Volga region of, of, of Russia, uh, part of the German-Russian immigration. Now, that, if, if I would see one of those curled hammers and say, gee, I wonder what's that there, what that's there for, and my grandma would tell me the story, you see, that that's a mystery. But it's something that I know only by revelation. And, and this is true if, as we take a step back from our faith, which many of us are just very familiar with, very comfortable, so we don't think about it that way, but think about a first century Jew who's, who's, who's saying, wait, you're telling me that that guy who was crucified on a cross as a criminal is really the Lord? you got to be kidding, right? But the reason why they knew they weren't kidding is because Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose again. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And that's what we celebrate this day. And he rose, and, and when he talks about that death, like Paul here, he uses the favorite New Testament word for death, which is not death, it's the word sleep. It's the word sleep. It is that favorite New Testament word for death, and Jesus himself had used it. You remember when uh, Jairus' daughter was sick, and they sent for Jesus, and Jesus, come heal her, and he's on the way, and a woman has another uh, medical issue, he takes care of that, and by this time it's too late, Jairus' daughter has died. And they come to him and say, don't bother Jesus, she's dead. And he says, no, she's not dead. She's only sleeping. And we know the rest of the story. He went into that room with Peter, James, and John and the parents. He took her by the hand and said, little girl, I say to you, rise to leave the boom. And she got up. You see, Jesus used this word. He also used it of Lazarus in John chapter 11 when his sisters had told him he was sick and he knew that Lazarus had died that Lazarus has fallen asleep. Now, why does he use the word sleep? Well, because, right, when you lay down, like you did last night, go to sleep, you expected this morning you were going to wake up. Might be with the sunshine, might be with an alarm clock, you know, might be for some other reason you had to get up, but you woke up, and you woke up this morning, and you expected wholeheartedly to do that last night when you went to bed. Um, So the favorite New Testament word for that is sleep because you expect to wake up. I'm sorry, where my brain just went, I'll just tell you. Because my brain is working in other ways when I'm preaching, you know. Um, I got a call from Judy Holmago this morning, the Harold Holmago passed away at 8.02 on Easter morning. You know? Well, I say it but I say and and, uh, and that's what she said on Easter morning, you know. And... Uh, I, ex I expect that, you know, last night they probably expected him to wake up this morning. Well, he did, we believe, but his soul woke up in heaven. And, and that's the, the comfort that we have. So when, whenever the Bible talks about death, it's sleep because uh, that's in anticipation of waking up again. If you think about it, all of the uh, kind of normal funeral kind of trappings in, in American culture, because it's Judeo-Christians, still reflect this, right? So the coffin is supposed to be a substitute for the bed. If you ever go to a visitation, the head is resting on a pillow, right? And a lot of people don't know this, but the original um, 
uh, word meaning for cemetery in the original language is a dormitory. So the whole idea of resting in peace, you know, it's, it's all tied up with even our traditional funeral traditions, this idea that, that, that we fall asleep in the sleep of death, and we expect we're going to wake up again. And not only are we going to wake up, we're going to wake up different, we're going to wake up transformed or made new. And, and that's what the Apostle Paul says, that if it, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, so they're not able to die again, and we will be changed. And, and that's why so often the butterfly is used as a symbol for a resurrection. Because, you know, the butterfly that comes out of the cocoon is the same thing as the caterpillar that spins it. It's the same thing. It's just been transformed, taken a different shape, given a different body in this uh, new uh, place. And, and we know that Jesus' body was transformed. Yes, it was real. He ate with his disciples. He talked to his disciples. They could touch him. They could see the scars and put their hands in his hands and, uh, and, and in his side. Um, but the very first night, uh, Easter night, it's always interesting to me. Um, he shows up and, and uh, he says, you got anything to eat? And they give him a piece of broiled fish and he eats it in their presence to let him know, yeah, it's a real body. And yet he got into that room without opening a door and it was a room that was locked for fear of the Jews. Asked me how he did it. I had no clue, you know. But I don't know how he turned water into wine. I don't know how he walked on water. I don't know how he fed 5,000 people with a few uh, fish and a few loaves of bread. I don't know how he did a lot of things. Um, and, and, but when he speaks, we know that it's true. It's why we believe when he says, this is my body, this is my blood, it really is the gift of himself in and under the bread and the wine. We will be transformed. We will be made new. And, and, and this gives us confidence. And, and that confidence uh, in that secure future is of um, the way that we're clothed. And this is the way the Apostle Paul goes on to say it. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Now very often we think about clothes. We uh, think about uh, uh, robes. Uh, because that also is uh, the idea that we're clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Uh, in fact, uh, the clergy clothing is supposed to represent it. Why am I wearing white? Not because I'm a perfect guy. Just ask my wife and my kids. They'll tell you differently. My parents would do, right? But because I've been bathed and washed in the blood of Christ, I am white in God's eyes because I have his righteousness. Actually, uh, in the 42 years that I've served as a pastor, I think the clothes have best symbolized it, although they went out a long time ago, was the old cassock of the servants. You know what I'm talking about? The cassock is the black, long robe. Uh, sometimes you would see uh, priests, especially Orthodox priests, just in the black, long robe. And, and that was a symbol that were sin from head to foot. So it covered us from our necks down to our feet. And then over that was uh, overlaid what was called the surplus, which was just a, a, a white uh, kind of uh, uh, covering that went over the black to say Jesus has covered me with his sin. Now that's the way we usually think about being dressed in the robes of righteousness, but here he's not talking about that. Here he's talking about being clothed in the resurrection body, um, which is going to be different, at least in these ways, that right now your body is perishable. I don't know about you, but it's heck getting old. And some of you know who have been here regularly that I've been hobbling around a number of times because... For whatever reason, my wheels have had problems. My ankle, my knee. I mean, it's just, it's a pain, right? Um, but my body's going to be different. It's not going to be perishable anymore. It's going to be imperishable. It's not going to be mortal. I know I'm going to die, you know? Um, we're all, that's, that's one thing that's guaranteed, you know? Taxes and death, they say. And they both hit on the same weekend, right? You got to file your taxes, and we're talking about Jesus' death on the same day. Um, yeah, but we're going to be clothed. We're going to be clothed in the resurre resurrection body, and like that of Jesus. That's what the Bible says. That He's transforming our lowly bodies so that they might be like His glorious body, with the power that enabled Him to subdue all things to Himself. And we know this because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. And when we 
come back, we know from the book of the prophet Isaiah that there's going to be quite a party. Uh, Isaiah, when he speaks about the messianic uh, reunion that happens on the day of resurrection, speaks about it this way. He says, on this mountain, and, and Isaiah was talking about uh, the mountain in Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified and he rose from the dead. Um, Isaiah didn't know it yet, but that's the mountain he was talking about. On the mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wine. By the way, best of meats means AAA prime. It, in the original language, is the fattest of the fattest, you know, kind of stuff, because that's where all the juicy stuff comes from. Um, and on this mountain, he'll destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheep that covers all nations, and he'll swallow up death forever. Uh, this is a picture of a, a first century woolen shroud around a, a person, because that's what they would do. You had to wrap the body, usually in layers of spices and a shroud, uh, about 75 pounds of spices typically, and you didn't have a funeral director do it for you, you did it yourself. And then you lay the body in the grave, and it had to be in the grave within 24 hours of the time of death, according to Old Testament Jewish ceremonial law. So when he says the sheet that covers all nations, he's talking about that shroud that covers people as they're being buried, and that shroud is going to be swallowed up forever. And and um, and when you think about celebrating with family and friends, I'm sure a lot of you got uh, places to go. Um, and uh, people you're celebrating with maybe have a little bit of a feast. Is it appropriate on Easter? Absolutely, because it looks forward to an even greater feast, the feast that will happen in, in heaven. And we have that confidence, that security, because Jesus rose from the dead. Um, and, and he's surprised, just like I, I hope I surprised a few of the kids up here with that egg, right? Uh, Jesus surprised a lot of people. Ken Davis writes uh, about a woman who looked out her window and she saw her German shepherd shaking the life out of their neighbor's rabbit. And they didn't get along with that neighbor. So she knew she was going to be in trouble. It would be a disaster. So she grabbed her broom, she went out, pummeled the dog until it dropped the now extremely dead rabbit out of its mouth. And then she panicked. She didn't know what to do. So she brought the rabbit in. Um, she gave it a bath, she blew dry and combed its fur, restoring it to its original fluffiness, snuck into the neighbor's yard, propped the rabbit back up in the cage, and an hour later she heard screams coming from next door. And she asked her neighbor what's going on, she said, our rabbit, our rabbit had died two weeks ago when we buried it. <laughs> and now he's back. <laughs> John Orberg uh, connects this particular story that Ken Davis tells to Jesus' resurrection with the following comment. He says, people in, in ancient, the ancient world knew that dead rabbits stayed dead. And they also knew that dead rabbis stayed dead. N.T. writes, another new biblical uh, scholar says, there were many messianic movements, we know this from actual biblical history, in that first century, and in every case, every would-be Messiah got crucified by Rome as Jesus did. Yet there's not a single other case where we hear the slightest mention of disappointed followers claiming that their master, their lord, their hero had been raised from the dead. They knew better. But Jesus' disciples did, confident in their faith, confident that they had a secure future, no matter what might come their way. Isaiah goes on to say in his prophecy, the sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He'll remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day they'll say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. In that day, he'll remove the disgrace of his people. And, and Job, uh, again, over a thousand years before the time that Jesus lived, spoke of that confidence in that uh, Old Testament lesson appointed for this day. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon this earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God with my own eyes, I and not another. And you and I, because Jesus rose from the dead, have that same confidence. And, and that confidence is there because we know that by faith, 
what he did becomes ours. You know, right now the Bucks are headed for another championship run. We hope, right? Um, and and when we think about uh, what happens on a court of play, right? When somebody shoots and maybe your vision is obscured, you might say, "Well, did we score?" And you say, "Yeah, we scored." Somebody else saw it. And uh, at the end of the game. Uh, somebody might ask you, well, I know you went, did we win? And you say, yes, we won. Now, you weren't on the court at all. You didn't even shoot a single basket. You didn't dribble the ball even once, right? But that victory is yours. How much more is that victory ours that Paul speaks about? And that's why he says, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is, is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And when Jesus rose from the grave, that is, as the Bible says, the first fruits of all those who rise from the grave, that guarantees that you and I are going to see life again after we die. And yet, Christian faith isn't just about the future. It's about the present. It's about standing firm and, and following. It's interesting that after, when Paul gets to the conclusion of the celebration of the resurrection, right? He says, oh, right, we got this victory. Where is death state? Thanks be to God. He gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. What's his very next sentence? It's this one. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. In other words, it makes a difference not only in your hope for when you die, but your life that you live. What difference does it make? It, 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 we realize Jesus is calling us into 100% Commitment, what he says, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And that means that our lives, uh, we place the hands of Jesus. We want to serve him with 100%, 24-7 of our lives, standing firm as he comes because we know that a life lived in the power and promise of his loving grace will last. Um, Russell Moore uh, in a blog, Independence Day in the Empty Tomb, uh, wrote this. He said, a, a few years ago, I stood at the grave of Thomas Jefferson and I was prompted to give thanks for his life and legacy. After all, you and I know if it wasn't for Jefferson and his majestic, majestic declaration of independence, there might not even be a United States of America and certainly not a country that has the values of, and is quite like what it is now. But he says, standing at Jefferson's grave prompted me to realize that Jefferson is, well, he's in a grave. His anti-supernaturalism is well seen if you take a look at his famous Bible, which is on display, uh, because he cut all the miraculous parts of the Bible out. Most sig significantly, he cut out the bodily resurrection. And, and he goes on to say, I love Jefferson for standing up against King George, but not for standing up against King Jesus. And yet 200 years later, after Jefferson died, belief in the resurrection of Jesus still persists. Just days after I was at this hero's grave, Christians from all over the world, despite all this science and all this progress and all this technology, have become more convinced and confess with the earliest believers in the catacombs of Rome, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Thomas Jefferson, he's still dead. I still thank God for him. But standing at his grave, he reminds me how limited even his legacy is in the grand scheme of uh, trillions of years of cosmic time. And it also reminds me of the contrast with the one whose monument isn't in a house or even a simple grave marker. It's instead in a borrowed tomb that's no longer filled. The empty tomb is itself a declaration of independence. By Jesus rising from the dead, God declared him and all who are in him free from death, free from the curse, free from Satan's accusations. I suppose you could say that, that Jesus has given us unalienable rights and among these, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, except for us, these blessings don't end at the graveyard. It's why Easter matters. And 
Craig Reschel uh, said this uh, in summary about why Easter matters. Why, when you believe the river is in Jesus, how does it make a difference? Well, first of all, you share your faith. Why? Because you got good news. You know, it's kind of like a, a baby being born. It's birth announcements. They go out all over the place. A wedding's going to happen, and you want everybody to know. It's good news, and so you share your faith. Secondly, you can believe you can change and be transformed by the power of this risen Lord who uh, has the power to transform our hearts and our minds and, and our lives. Uh, and he says we also can get past the past. What does he mean by that? It means your sins don't stick to you. And all the stuff you grieve that you wish you would have done differently or done over, he says, like, go of it because God does. How do you know that? Because Jesus paid for those sins on the cross and his resurrection is the proof that they are all forgiven. And, and you also believe that he's more than fair. You know, okay, Pastor Poppy, if you ask him, how are you? He says, bless the Lord. So here's another one I like to use once in a while. Besides, blessed by the Lord, better than I deserve. How are you? I'm better than I deserve. Because I know because of my sin, I don't deserve what I all have in my life. But by the grace of God, He fills my life with good things. And I believe He is more than fair. I don't want Him to be fair with me. I want Him to be gracious and loving and kind as I have come to know Him. And, and because I know Him that way, I have true happiness. And, and, and so I want to serve Him where I am. Wherever He places me, I'm confidently uh, committed to follow Him. So let me rise. So would you rise and let me pray about that uh, on this Easter. Lord Jesus, we thank and praise you that you rose from the dead and gave us assured certain hope. And more than that, you, that you have assured us that um, the victory over death and the grave has been won for us. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us as uh, we live with you as our risen Lord to let you rise daily in our hearts through the blessing of your forgiveness and the guidance of your word so that we might be truly blessed both here and in eternity in Jesus. Now may that peace which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in your Jesus, the life everlasting. Amen. Let's confess our faith together in Luther's explanation to the second article. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own, and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence and blessedness, even as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns through all eternity. This is most certainly true. Today we dedicate our offerings with this resurrection verse from 1 Peter 1. Through Christ you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you purify yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, Love one another deeply from the heart. Let's pray. Risen Lord Jesus, you raised us from death to life with your spirit led faith, connecting us to your Father. Use these offerings to raise people from death to life through your living spirit, connecting them to life in you. Amen. We continue in prayer. Lord of the resurrection on this day, who turned our wailing into dancing, our mourning into gladness. I praise you for having snatched me from the depths of the grave. Daily fill my heart with resurrection hope, joy, confidence, and forgiveness. Your prophets and people of the past have faithfully witnessed your saving presence. Make us bold to join with the saints of the past, like Paul and courageously testify to your mighty resurrection today. Help me to more fully grasp and to more faithfully proclaim my pardon from sin through your death and my confidence in your forgiveness through your victorious resurrection. Christ Jesus, as we move through this world, from physical birth to the physical rebirth of our resurrection, 
We encounter painful tragedies and awesome joys. Today we bring before you our cares and celebrations, including the need for comfort, healing, and strength for Richard, Genevieve, Charlene, and Joanne, and our shut-ins along with all those whose Easter joy is tempered with physical challenges. We especially ask, Lord, that you would bring resurrection comfort to Judy Holnagel and her family at Harold's death, and uh, uh, bless them as they walk this, uh, through this time of grief. We give thanks to you for the many blessings that you poured into Paul and Charity Eilstock's marriage as they celebrate 24 years uh, together. And along with Sharon Holliberger, we ask you to pour out your support for our generous uh, St. John's family of faith, that you would bless us with health for our families and, and give us the gracious ability to recognize every blessing as a gift from your hand. Bring Easter joy to our hearts, uh, along with Tom Holliberger, Evelyn Holmes, Abby and Lucy Jancic and Franco Beth and Luca Sono. And grant protection for all those who serve for us, for Chrissy, Julia, David, Benjamin, and Christian, who serve for us in the armed forces, and for Christ followers and missionaries throughout the world, especially those undergoing oppression and persecution. Bolster the faith of all those in need. Multiply the sincere thanksgivings of all those who celebrate this day. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do, in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after the supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. We praise you now, Lamb of Sacrifice. You gave yourself to take away our sin by your death. You destroyed the power of death. And so with Mary Magdalene, Peter, Paul, and all the witnesses of the resurrection, all the saints in heaven, with angels, archangels, cherubim, and seraphim, we praise you, looking forward to the eternal feast in heaven as we sing.
brought us from bondage to freedom and from death to life, fill you with his joy. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And the Lord look upon you with his favor and give to each of you his peace. Amen. Hallelujah.